Hello and welcome to Revive Church. My name is Phil and it's my great honor and privilege to host you today online um, as you join us for week two of our brand new Flourish series. We want to welcome you uh, from wherever you're watching, if you're watching at home uh, or with friends or you're by yourself today. We're so glad that you could join us online for this incredible series. We'd love to connect you with our church if that's something that you'd like to do um, and refer you to our website, www.revivechurch.ca.za. There you can find out everything you need to know about our church, uh, what we believe, the things we do, and the things we teach. And two things we'd love to connect you with specifically today, firstly, is life groups. Uh, we believe that life is better together, and we'd love to connect you with a life group today. Maybe there's something that prevents you from coming to church on a Sunday, uh, but you'd love to connect with our church in the midweek. We have got incredible life groups for different types of people in different seasons, and we'd love to connect you uh, with one today. Our groups have just started. They're fresh and new. Uh, and we'd love to have you join. So if that is something that you're interested in, please head over to our website. And on the website, www.revivechurch.ca.ca, uh, you're able to fill in a connection card, an online card, where you can let us know that you're looking for a life group, you're looking for community, and we can connect you with a group in your area and in your season. And secondly, some very exciting news. Our Pathway courses are back up and running. Sunday the 11th and Sunday the 18th of February, we've been running our Pathway courses at church on a Sunday directly after the service. These courses are DNA, Grow and Shape, and these courses are the next step for you in our church if you have yet to complete them. DNA is our membership course where you can find out everything you need to know about Revive Church. And if you're interested in becoming a member here, we'd highly encourage that you do DNA. Grow is our discipleship course where we teach you some basic habits and principles that you can follow about growing in your relationship with God and taking steps as a Christian and as a believer. And lastly, our shape course is incredible for anybody who wishes to find out their design, their God shape, what God has created them to do to build and serve and extend the kingdom of God. These courses are for you. We're so excited about them. Last year, we experienced over 100 people going through our courses, and they found out more about how God has created them and how they can grow in their relationship with God. We want to encourage you to sign up for our Pathway courses. Again, I'll direct you to the website where you can fill in a connection card, and there you can let us know what course you'd like to do. If you haven't yet done any courses, DNA is the next step for you. If you've completed DNA, Grow is the next step for you. And if you've finished both DNA and Grow, then Shape is a perfect course for you. We'd encourage you, head over to the website and sign up for those courses. Well, you've picked a great day to join us online. We have got week two of our brand new series, Flourish. So it's got an incredible, incredible message. I encourage you, take some notes out, lean in. This message is gonna bless you. Cheers. Well, hello, Revive family. So glad you guys are online today and welcome to the service. I hope you guys are keeping strong, keeping well and are ready to dig a little bit deeper into a life of flourishing. Last week spoke about how we're created to flourish. And this week I'm gonna kind of give the, the underpinning or the foundation of a flourishing life. But first of all, let me ask you this. Uh, have, you ever, have you heard of the concept of a keystone habit? Now, I think it's Charles Duhigg who comes up with this idea of a keystone habit. And it's what it is, is it's a habit where um, you set off one thing, you do one thing, like create a habit in your life. And then that has a knock on effect in a positive way into other areas of your life. Almost as if like um, you set up the first domino, you knock it down and then the rest has a domino effect in your life on habits, you know, where and he says like it's one habit that you implement in your life that has a knock-on effect on other habits in your life. For example, in my life, um, nutrition has always been a difficult thing. Like we've always tried to eat healthy, but this, in the last couple of months, have actually tried to be very intentional about our nutrition. Get, get, we've gone to a nutritionist, find out how we can eat properly and healthy, and so we've done that and like for our body types and it's cool because I've actually seen some results and which has been really really positive so it means that I'm you know I'm snacking less because I'm more full than I've ever been before because I'm eating the right kinds of things I'm like eating more protein and uh, supplementing with a lot of veggies and stuff like that and having snacks and so that one habit of changing the way that I'm eating has actually had such a positive impact in other areas of my life. So the, the discipline that I'm winning there is actually now starting to produce fruit in other areas as well. So for me, that looks like, hey, because I'm eating healthy, I actually go to the gym 
because I'm seeing results. And when I'm gymming, I, the, I wanna reinforce the fact that I'm eating well. Like I don't wanna use gym as an excuse to break my eating plan. And so, cause I'm not on a diet, I'm just eating differently and, and, and getting a better psychology around food. And so I'm training, I'm training more regularly and I, because I'm eating well and because I'm eating well, I'm training. And so it's a, this knock on effect. And, and then because of that, I actually feel like, hey, I, I wanna keep on getting healthy. So I'm starting to look at sleep and trying to understand sleep hygiene a little bit better and trying to sleep more so my body's more rested and healthy. Um, and all of these things, and I'm actually finding that I'm experiencing discipline in other areas. Why? Because of one thing, a significant habit in my life has changed, is having a positive knock-on effect on everything else. And in today's message, in today's online service, I, I want to offer you the keystone for a flourishing life. In fact, more than just a keystone to the flourishing life, I want to give you the hinge that a life of flourishing swings on. In fact, more than that, I don't just want to give you an aspect of flourishing or a pillar in order to flourish. I want to give you the foundation of a flourishing life. Because our highest calling is in fact our highest priority. And Jesus said it this way in Matthew 22, when he was asked about, by some teachers of the law, some Pharisees and scribes, he was like, hey, what's the most important law that we should follow? And now at that point, they had categorized around 600 laws and traditions that the Jewish people were supposed to live by. Now, come on, can you imagine living up to 600 laws? I mean, we struggle to live up to 10. You know, never mind 600. And so they were always looking about how they could prioritize the law. What would be most important? And so they asked Jesus, what's the most important? Jesus said this, hey, it's to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul. And then to love other people as well as, as you love yourself. But he says, hey, the greatest priority for you and for me is to love God which means to worship God. That is, worship is our highest calling. It is the foundation of a flourishing life. It is the hinge that our lives swing on. Because again, like you and I, we can, we can try and flourish in 50 to 100 years in our lifetime. We can aim for success but we don't just want success in an area because we've been created to flourish. We want to flourish across our whole life. But what's the point of flourishing just for 50 to 100 years when we can flourish for all of eternity? I don't want to be so invested in the here and now that I forget my eternal life and my eternal future because that's what true flourishing is. Flourishing in the presence of Jesus always in our life, being able to sit in, um, in eternity and experience the joy of His presence. That's what real flourishing is about. That's what true flourishing is. And so our highest calling in life is worship and worshiping God. That's what loving God really is. Loving God is our worship to Him. And we can do that in a sense of like, I'm going to worship God out of a duty or because I have to. And the truth is, He commands us to worship Him. Not worshiping Him is rejecting and denying Him. So we are commanded to worship Him, but we can worship Him from a point of it's a duty and I have to, and because I have to and it's a duty, it actually comes down to religious rule keeping rather than a revelation and a response to what He has done for us. And so what it looks like is, okay, I better do X, Y, and Z because if I step out of line, God is going to, you know, strike me with a thunderbolt or he's going to do something to me or, you know, it's this, it's this um, reward and punishment game that we play with God rather than realizing that there is, some, there is a deeper fuel and a deeper motivation that actually causes us to respond to God in real worship, in deep worship. So you can either worship God out of duty and religious rule keeping or there's a revelation that you can receive from God that will actually set you free and give you the fuel, the real fuel for worship. And that is about receiving God's love. Because you and I, we can't just decide, hey, I'm going to worship God and it's going to be great. And I'm going to be, I am the motivation for that. 
No, like real worship is always a response to not only who God is, but what he's already done for us. You know, that he is the God in heaven who created us, who loves us, who cares about us, who sent Jesus into the world with the sole purpose of reuniting us with him. That God loved us so, so, so much. And to show you how much God loves us, I want to read to you quickly from, um, from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 uh, through to 19. And this is, what, this is what Paul writes to the Ephesian church. He says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure and the fullness of God. I absolutely love that, that we are so loved. God loves us so much. You can't, you can't run away from his love. You can't hide from his love. There's no depths of your, that your soul will take you, that God's love does not undergird you. There's no run, running away from it. God's love is so deep that even it covers our mistakes and our wrongdoing. It's so high that we can. there's nothing greater in life to achieve. Like his love is all encompassing, all surrounding. You can try to run from God and His love will still find you. His love is amazing. It's magnanimous. There's a word for you. It is magnanimous. It's a huge love. And that's sometimes difficult to, I don't know, it's difficult to receive that kind of love. But Paul's prayer is that, hey, I'm praying for you that you could understand, that you can get a revelation of the level and the depth of God's love for you. There is nothing that you've done in your life that where you turn to God, He's not there to show His love towards you. Now the question is obviously, hey, do, will we respond to that love? Because the way we worship God and love God is almost as the way we experience the sunset. I remember um, late Donovan Kutsia, he would say this. He says, when you sit and you watch the sunset, you go, wow, that's amazing. You don't go, wow, and then the sunset appears, right? So, so we don't, we're not the initiators of God's love. God is the initiator. And our response of wow and thank you and is I love you back. And so we flourish when we live out our highest calling in life, which is to be loved by God and then to love God in return. Hey, God loves you so much. God cares about every detail of your life, everything that you're going through, everything that you're going to go through. He doesn't want you to go through it alone. And I want to let you know, no matter what's been happening in your life, no matter the rejection you may have experienced by people, maybe even people in the church, people outside of the church, people in your own family, there is someone who loves you deeply, who cares about you intimately and wants to have an ongoing relationship with you. You are cared for and loved more than you can ever possibly imagine. And once you get a revelation of that, you can now start following God, following Jesus out of a revelation, out of a response to His love. Not out of rule keeping or out of duty, but out of desire, out of a heart that has been set alight by God's love for you. And so again, we flourish when we live at our highest calling in life, which is to be loved by God and then to love God in return. Let me show you just as an example of how this works out in Scripture. So Jesus, he, he's sitting at this table with some Pharisees and religious leaders and they're, and they're discussing things and they're talking because Jesus was so insightful and so wise and, and they knew that he was like a holy man, right? But then out of the, the corner of the, the room, there's this lady that approaches Jesus, never really making eye contact, maybe looking down, feeling maybe this sense of shame or like a lack of self-worth. 
and she comes to Jesus from, and she comes behind him and she begins to weep over his feet and she begins to wipe his feet and kiss his feet and pour out a fragrance of oil to anoint him, to anoint his feet. And in his mind, the Pharisee in Luke, I think it's chapter seven, his name is Simon and he, and he goes, and he's thinking in his heart, and he says, if Jesus really were a prophet, he would know how sinful this woman is. He would know all of the things that this woman has done wrong and against God. And so really thinking like, how could he be a prophet? How can he allow this woman to look, to, to, to be so close to him? And you know what? Jesus never keeps this woman at arm's length. He allows the woman to show proper adoration. And, and Jesus, knowing what Simon's thinking, because Jesus, every thought is exposed before the King of Kings. He's, he's thinking, he knows what Simon's thinking, and he says, Simon, I want to tell you a story. There were two people that owed this one person large sums of money. One owed him, you know, like debt of like maybe more than a bond on a house. Another one owed him a whole bunch of credit card debt, too much to pay back, you know. So they both owed him a lot of money, but the one owed him like an insane amount and the other one earned more than he could ever repay. And Jesus goes on to tell Simon the story of how the, the person who had the debt owed to them canceled the debt. He forgave the debt. And he asks Simon this question, right? Imagine you, how many of you like your, your debt, your bond cleared, forgiven, all that just let go of? We have a quite deep impact in your life, wouldn't it? Like you'd be feel like, oh, I'm free. So he asked Simon, Simon, tell me, which one of these, these two people were, loved this person the most, the, the, loved the person who forgave their debt? And Simon goes, well, I, I assume that the person who had the most debt forgiven and written off loved or appreciated the most. And Jesus tells him, yeah, you've, you've answered correctly. And then he says this line about this lady. He says, you know what? You didn't you know, anoint my, my head. You didn't wash my feet. But this woman has been crying and washing and anointing me since the moment I came in. And he says, Simon, those who have been forgiven much will love much. And those who have been forgiven little, they love little. Isn't that so true? And I don't know if Jesus is saying, hey, I've forgiven this person of these massive sins and I've forgiven this person of little sin. They're going to live differently. No, I think it comes down to our realization of what our sin actually is. I think until we understand what our sin actually cost God, what our sin actually did to Jesus, we won't be able to love him to the level of someone who does acknowledge and does understand. Because put it this way, you can have your life all together. You can be a Christian for 10, 15, 20 years and think, hey, everything on the outside looks clean. Everything on the outside looks right. I'm not the most sinful person in the room by, by human standards. You know, at least I'm not as bad as that person. But you know what? The longer you're a Christian, on the outside it might look ordered and clean, but on the inside there is still sin that can be trying to grab hold of your life. And it's only by the grace of God that we are forgiven of our sins. It's not that we're more or less sinful than other people. It's realizing that it is my sin and my shame that actually put Jesus on the cross. It's not somebody else's. It's not that person. It's not a person who's addicted to that substance or somebody who has done that thing. No, as innocent as my sin might seem to me, to God, it is a huge offense. And it was the reason that Jesus came to die on a cross to wash us clean by his perfect blood and give us a new covenant of hope and love and eternal life. So until I come face to face with my own sin, my own issues, and ask God to heal me of that, it means that I'm, my love is going to be affected by that. When you can allow yourself to come face to face with what, it put, what in you put Christ on the cross, you go, wow, he has forgiven me of so much. I love him. I adore him. And here's the thing. That's not out of 
compulsion. That's not out of duty. That's out of revelation. And when you love God out of revelation, you worship Him with your whole life. It's not just about singing songs. It's about a life that's lived in response to the goodness and the love, the abundant love that God has for you. I want to take you quickly to a passage to see where, like how this actually impacts our life practically. How, can we, how we can worship God. What does our worship to God actually look like? And it comes from Luke chapter 4, where Jesus is taken into the desert by the Holy Spirit. And in the desert, He is tempted by the devil. And He's tempted in three different ways. But there's one way that I want to share with you. It's in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through to 8. And it says, The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You know, what are trying to, like Jesus doesn't correct the devil saying, yep, no, I agree with you. Or he doesn't even look at that. He doesn't even respond to that. But that is exactly what Jesus wanted. He wanted the hearts of the whole world. He wanted the cities. He wanted the, the, the places and spaces and he still does. And that was offered to him. It was an allure. It was a temptation to say, hey, there's a shortcut. I will give all of this to you. If only you worship me. But you see, if, if Jesus came to that temptation and said, yep, that's what I want. I'm going to go and say, I'm going to bow down and worship you. He would never have gone to the cross. He would never have been able to pay for our sin and wash us clean through his sacrifice and to forgive us so that we can be reconciled to God. That would not have been possible. So Jesus was willing to take the long road. Why? That's the vision that, was, that, that, that maybe he wanted. But he knew that the vision meant nothing if he was not surrendered to the Lord. He was surrendered to the will of his Father. And so Jesus going, hey, that might be a temptation. That might be something you're offering me. But the scripture says, worship God only, you know. And that word worship that is used in the passage is the word proskuneo. It's a Greek word. And that word proskuneo literally means to bow down, to kneel down, to pay homage to, almost to someone of greater authority or someone of greater notoriety. Like, I am bowing and worshipping. I am acknowledging your greatness. And Jesus said, there's only one that deserves that, and that's the Father in heaven. And you know what? You and I, we're bowing down to something. We're worshiping something. You know, the devil wasn't saying, Jesus, hey, could you sing me a worship song and then I'll give you these towns? Yeah, singing is an expression of our worship, but it is not the motive of our worship. It is an aspect of worship, but it is not worship in and of itself. It is an expression. What worship is, is are our lives bow down to Him, to Jesus, to the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Or is our life surrendered and submitted? Is it His way before our way? That is how we know we're worshiping because worshiping is a response. So it's not about what songs you're singing, although sing songs. It's not Jesus serenading, serenading, the, serenading the devil. It's, it's Jesus honoring His Father above all else. And so you and I, we're worshiping something. It might be Jesus or it might not be Jesus. But he doesn't share his worship. He doesn't say, yeah, you can bow down to me and you can bow down to the world. You can bow down to me and you can bow down to your dreams and desires. It's all or it's nothing. And so the devil is saying, hey, would you bow down to me and I'll give you everything you want. And you know, what? he offers us the same choice. He offers us. He off offers us such a compelling vision of the future, of things that you truly, truly desire. Things that, hey, this is going to get you a better life. That's going to get you the promotion. This is going to give you freedom. These, getting caught up in this, is actually going to give you joy and meaning and getting caught up. If you, if you go for that, 
but you just have to bow down to those things. You have to let those things tell you what to do. And often those aren't even bad things. I mean, even in parents, if you're a parent, like it's so easy to bow down to the desires of your children. Like, hey, I'm just, but you can, if you bow down to your children or bow down to your family, you'll be a slave to them all your life. But if you worship God, everything else finds its proper place. And if you bow down to the things of this world, you're going to reap the fruit of that, which might be success in the eyes of the world, but it's not flourishing. Because you and I truly flourish when we live at our highest calling, which is to be loved by God and to love Him in return. Flourishing looks like a life bowed down. A life surrendered to God. What does that mean for you and I? When it's the workplace, well, is what I'm doing bowing down to God first before anything else? In my life, it's looked in many different ways. This is often a challenge that we have to face that I keep refacing. Because you know, I'm the kind of person, I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of person who, hey, I just want to run on ahead. I've got all these amazing ideas. I've got so many things I want to do. And I just want to run on ahead. And I'm like, come on, Lord. And Lord's like, mm, no. Because I'm not bowing down to His way. I'm just fulfilling what I want. And again, it's not bad things, but it's about priority. It's about, it's about what comes first. And so for me, like in Lara, like we've often desired to live in other countries around the world. Uh, because, not for any negative reason, just because we, we, we love that adventure. We, we love new cultures and stuff. And so even when we got married around the beginning in our 20s, we wanted to move. We felt like God said, no, we need to be here. And I love what I do. I, I, I'm called to lead and minister in a church context. And, and, and I love that. But throughout many times, I've, been, I've asked God, God, could you release us in different seasons? Could you release us? We want to go overseas. We want to do your work overseas. And, and God's often just said, no, I've called you here. And there's been times when it's gotten so close. And we always go back to God and say, okay, you know what? We're not bowing down to our desire of what we think we should do. We're going to come to God and say, God, your will and your way first and foremost. And that way we found great peace because I want the Holy Spirit to lead us. I want God to lead us. I don't want to just do what I want to do. Now, for some people, moving is great and they should do that. And for other people, it's, it's, it's other areas of life. It's work, it's family, it's you know, recreation, whatever it is, just say, hey, I want to live a life that's bowed down. And I promise you this, that if you'll live a life bowed down on your knees before God, and that's a figurative term, of course, is to go, that is actually the foundation that I'm building that has a life of true flourishing. We're going to hit other aspects of flourishing in the weeks, and, the weeks to follow this series. But this one is the keystone, the cornerstone, the hinge, the foundation. And I want to make sure that our foundation is solid. Man, wasn't that just a fantastic message today? We hope that it's found you exactly where you needed it to. Uh, the key, the hinge of flourishing in our lives is having that conviction. God loves us. And out of that conviction that we can be worshipers of a God who is so loving towards us. Hey, if that message has... Uh, triggered something in your heart today, or maybe you feel a sense uh, to take that step towards God um, and to recommit your life, or maybe for the very first time to commit your life to Jesus and to say, you know what, I need Jesus at the center of my life and everything that I do. We're so excited by that decision and we want to help you make that decision today. So that is you and you're saying, you know what, I really want to commit my life to God today, please don't make this decision alone. We'd love to connect with you and send you some incredible resources so you can right now Head over to our website as soon as this video finishes. Fill in a connection card. Let us know, hey, I took a step today. I took a step closer to God, and I want him to be the savior of my life. Do that, and we've got some incredible resources for you. Or maybe right now in the comment sections right here on YouTube, you are welcome to let us know, hey, I committed my life today. Leave a number or an email, and we'd love to get back to you and connect with you on that. And just before we close today, we'd love to give you an opportunity uh, to worship God with your giving. 
giving us a huge part of who we are as a church here at Revive Church. God has been so generous to us in numerous ways at, at the beginning of this year, throughout the whole of last year. And if you'd love to partner with us in giving today, we'd love to make that available to you. Um, our ways to give, our various ways to give are all online right now. You can head over to our website. And if you're an EFT giver, you're more than welcome to continue doing that. And there you'll find some details to give towards what God is doing in our church and in our community in our country. Well, we hope this message has been a blessing to you in the service. We'd love to see you again next week. Have an incredible rest of your day. We'll see you soon. Cheers.